It's my great pleasure now to introduce Bathsheba DeMuth, Assistant Professor of History and Environment and Society at Brown University. Professor DeMuth will present this year's Robert D. Clark Lecture in the Humanities. The Clark Lecture was established in 1994 and has been sustained since then through the generosity of the Oregon Community Foundation. We are grateful for the Foundation's steadfast support of the humanities and the OHC. The Clark Lecture aims to promote public discussion on the natural sciences, the history of Oregon, and the interface between science and social and cultural affairs as exemplified by Thomas Condon, frontier, frontier missionary, geologist, paleontologist, and founding member of the University of Oregon. The lectureship was named in honor of former UO President Robert D. Clark, author of the book, The Odyssey of Thomas Condon. The Clark's lectureship's emphasis on the public discussion of natural sciences and the interface between science and social and cultural affairs, as well as our themes focus on climate justice help ex helps explain why we've chosen Beth Sheba DeMuth as this year's Clark Lecturer. An environmental historian specializing in the lands and seas of the Russian and North American Arctic, Beth Sheba DeMuth is an assistant professor of history and environment and society at Brown University, a fellow of the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society, and an affiliated faculty member in Brown's programs in Native American and Indigenous Studies and Science and Technology Studies. Professor DeMuth's interest in Northern environments and cultures began when she was 18 and moved to the village of Old Crow in the Yukon. For over two years, she mushed huskies, hunted caribou, fished for salmon, tracked bears, and otherwise learned to survive in the taiga and tundra. In the years since, she has visited Arctic communities across Eurasia and North America. She studies how the histories of peoples, ideas, places, and non-human species interact, intersect. Her writing on these subjects has appeared in publications from the American Historical Review to the New Yorker. Professor DeMuth's fascinating and eloquent book, uh, Floating Coast, An Environmental History of the Bering Strait, has garnered numerous honors and awards, including the NPR Library Journal Barnes and Noble and Kirkus Review Best Book of 2019 Award, the 2020 George Perkins Marsh Prize, the 2020 Hal K. Rothman Book Prize, the 2020 Eric Zensi Prize, the 2020 W. Turntine Jackson Award, the 2020 William Mills Prize, and the 2020 Julia Ward Howe Nonfiction Prize. Given Professor, Professor DeMuth's scholarly expertise, fascinating experiences, and formidable talents as a writer, there's no doubt that her Clark Lecture today, The Reindeer and the End of the World, will provide us with a rich and illuminating perspective on our theme of climate justice. Please join me in welcoming Bathsheba DeMuth. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, thank you to Melissa, Jen, and Jenna uh, for arranging this lecture and taking care of all the behind the scenes details, which really add up in the, in the Zoom times. Um, and I very much appreciate it. And to the Oregon Humanity Center and the Clark Lectureship uh, for inviting me to be here with you. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you today from where I am um, to echo Paul's uh, land acknowledgement on Narragansett and Wampanoag lands coming to where you are um, in, in Oregon and perhaps elsewhere around the country. I'm going to do the awkward thing we all have to do these days, which is pause so that I can share my screen. Um, there we go. Um, and I wish to start this lecture with a little bit of a disclaimer about the title. Um, climate is there in the, the second word of this talk, um, but I'm not really a historian of, of past climates. Uh, what I am is a historian who passes any time that I possibly can um, in a climate that looks, if you live in temperate places, somewhat extreme, the Arctic and subarctic uh, of both Russia and North America. This is also a part of the world where you do not need to visit an archive or use a, a model projection to see climate change. Uh, the, the poles, as many of you probably know, are warming at about twice the rate of temperate regions, which makes the Arctic and subarctic um, anomalies that you can experience in very real time, premonitions of what temperate zones will experience over the coming decades. <clears throat> 
What I want to do today is visit the pasts of one of these northerly places um, on the Chukchi Peninsula, there on the left side of your map, um, which is, just to put it in perspective, so far in the northeast of Russia that it is closer to Boston than it is to Moscow. Several years ago, I was on the Chukchi Peninsula um, traveling north to where the Chukchi reindeer brigades uh, run their herds along the Omvam River. So I was driving north from that kind of spit coming off the Gulf of Anandir toward the village of Ambuema there on the map. Um, and I was with a young Chukchi man named Alex, uh, who has distant relatives um, in that village of Ambuema. And we were bringing them gifts for an upcoming celebration. Um, biscuits, sugar, candles, bread, tinned butter, evaporated milk, uh, and of course, tea. And one of the strange parts of being a historian, uh, and perhaps particularly an environmental historian, is that you often come to places and landscapes that you already know in some form through the archives. I had never been to this part of Chukotka before, physically, but I had walked here in a way that we do in our profession, in the company of the dead. And what the dead had told me about this part of the Chukchi Peninsula was to pack warm. In Vladivostok archives, I had read about August snow squalls whipping cold and wind across the tundra. In Moscow archives, I had read about sea ice on still water by September. But on this particular August afternoon in 2018 was the hottest summer in recorded memory in the Arctic. All through June and July, people would say offhand or with worry or with a kind of gallows humor that we were living through the end of the world or that it was Armageddon. And these conversations were part of a larger trend. The first word of what I think still is the most widely read article about climate change uh, written by David Wallace Wells is Doomsday. Scholars working on theories of social collapse from Joseph Tainter to Peter Turchin to Jared Diamond offer grim, highly reported um, and very popular takes on the general state of the world. Even the tenor of much climate history with exceptions for scholars like Dagmar de Groot and some others, give a very dubious view of past social responses to perturbations in the climate. Which is very grim news, given that just a few weeks after I returned from the Chukchi Peninsula, scientists at the IPCC gave the world 12 years to reduce carbon emissions or risk a level of warming so great it was headlined frequently as climate apocalypse. That number of years is now down to nine. The foreboding has become so intense that climate change has become the background moral dread to even our fiction. And I don't mean here speculative fiction about the future, but contemporary realist fiction in works like Jenny Offel's Weather or Christine Smallwood's Campus Satire, Life of the Mind, both of which pit the daily realities of life in a late capitalist America against the looming shadow of catastrophe. Therefore, the narrative mode of apocalypse is very present for the far North in particular and for the human future in general. We are constantly given prophecies of rupture. Being trained as a historian makes it hard to see such stories as neutral. They shape the borders of our minds and of our politics. So I spent much of that trip to Chukotka wondering, what is the attraction of these narratives at absolute end? And what meanings slink in with these proclamations of apocalypse? I wanna take you with me now over the next 40 minutes or so on that trip on the road toward Amguema and through the pasts that we encountered on the road from Chukchi theories of history to Bolshevik aspirations for the future. Both speak to what apocalyptic narratives, the allure of ending worlds and what they foreclose, and the experience of surviving actual worlds ending might offer us in the present. It is a historical exploration, but also one a bit obsessed as I am with thinking about what the tools and modes of history can offer to our present. <laughs> 
One of the dead in whose company I have passed some days is a man named Karl Janovich Lux. He was dark haired and handsome, if we can believe this particular photograph, when he wrote the following from the Chukchi Peninsula to a bureau in Moscow in the 1920s. Quote, the Chukchi people are the majority of the native population of the Chukchi Peninsula. Under the czars, these natives were only of interest as suppliers of furs. Nobody gave a thought to protecting the base of the native economy to improving their way of life. As a result, the fur trade was nearly extinguished and reindeer husbandry fell off catastrophically. To fix this destruction is our task." End quote. In Carl's life is a history of apocalyptic allure of what sings to us beyond the horizon of a demolished now. He was born on the Western edge of the Russian empire in 1888 to peasants so destitute that his father nearly sold an infant Carl to the childless baron who owned the lands his parents worked. As a boy, he tended cattle. Around him, most people were confined to agricultural toil on old noble estates or industrial toil in new factories. His parents were unable to afford education beyond basic literacy so Carl became a deckhand when he was hardly more than a child. His voyages took him through Baltic ports thrumming with discontent. Strikers protested factories that rent their bodies. Bread lines turned into riots after days of hunger. Students demanded representative government. Tsar Nicholas II, heir to four centuries of autocratic rule, sheltered in his palaces, spent lavishly, and hired more police. The people that Carl met outside these aristocratic walls found their presence so unjust, so sickly, so impossible, that their question was not when would it end, but how. Carl heard Baptists preaching hellfire, Orthodox priests invoking the salvation of saints, and a dozen other sects calling down the final judgment. These visions shared something of a plot. First, there was the apocalypse, and then a reign of harmony and perfection. It's a very old story, one passed from the Middle East to Europe, from Jewish cosmologies into Christian traditions, going back at least 3,000 years to the prophecies of Zoroaster, who foretold a cataclysmic battle between the forces of light and dark. The triumph of light would give the righteous a new life, one without suffering or toil. It was also a life in which the cycles of birth and death would end. The world would become linear and immortal. Carl did not become a Baptist or worship saints. He joined a socialist reading circle. In the historian Yuri Slovskin's masterful reading of the Russian socialist condition, the plot that Karl learned also came from Zoroaster's lineage. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels foretold how the darkness of capitalist exploitation would become the light of communist utopia. Between these poles was a kind of earthly revelation, what socialists called revolution. A word that Sloskin reminds us promised the end of the old world and the beginning of a new just one. I met Carl in an age crumpled file in Vladivostok where I learned what he would give up for this new world. At 17, he was arrested for distributing illegal pamphlets. For the next decade, he was in and out of custody. Carl left a four year, year term in Orel Central Penitentiary, which is the prison at the bottom uh, right hand corner of the screen with tuberculosis. In his autobiography, he described being bound by a guard with quote, the ropes eating into my body to the bones at hands and feet, which were swollen and blackened. So it was impossible to control them. When Vladimir Lenin brought the revolution to Russia in the bitterly cold and hunger filled winter of 1917, Karl was in Siberian exile. He joined Lenin's army when it reached the North and then moved on to, 
to Chukotka, where he was tasked by the new Soviet government with, quote, liquidating the consequences of century old injustices from the tundra. So when Carl wrote, to fix this destruction is our task, part of what he meant was, we shall end the unjust world and beyond it is a life without want. I find much to admire in the purity of this vision. Carl went to prison and into exile to help found the kingdom of freedom on earth. One appeal of the apocalypse is that it can make those on its threshold feel world historically important. But what is this place called Chukotka that Carl went to save? For one thing, Chukotka is reindeer country, and it has been at least since the end of the last ice age. Reindeer, as this slide shows, are almost never alone and almost never still. They move constantly to find fresh pasture and breezes to keep mosquitoes from tormenting their flesh. And as I have learned from some time spent with them, their movements make a gently percussive sound as they walk, for there's a tendon that slides over their, a bone in their hooves. So they kind of clack as they walk. Chukotka is also Chukchi country, and it has been for thousands of years. In Chukchi history, um, the far reaching past is divided into a time of wild reindeer, when reindeer were very important, and a closer, uh, more near to us past in which reindeer become domestic. Centuries before the first Russian speaker came to the Chukchi Peninsula, Chukchi people and wild reindeer struck a bargain in the telling from Chukchi histories in the relations that we call domestication. Reindeer who lived as familiars with people were protected from wolves and bears. People who lived as familiars with reindeer were protected from starvation. In the history that the Chukchi tell of themselves, a few dozen domesticated reindeer made food and shelter newly dependable. Hundreds or thousands of reindeer made politics newly potent as the bodies of large herds carried the authority of giving gifts and armies fed for war. In the 1700s, Chukchi fought and won battles against the Russian empire, expelling them except for trade on the margins of the Chukchi territory. Yet to walk out with a herd of reindeer on a tundra morning was to enter a world where human authority did not extend fully even to the tame animals snuffling outside Chukchi tents. For the Chukchi, the hills around them were home to many beings, to mushroom shaped men and giants with gaping mouths and wild reindeer people, any of which could steal a herd. Some of these beings were kin, some were foes. Valleys, rivers, reindeer, foxes, walruses, all bore souls that required entreaty. To live in Chukchi country required supplication and frank acknowledgement of dependence on beings other than humans. That is, social life was made up of persons, not all of whom were human. Many were reindeer. Chukchi theories of history took from this a sense that the past contained linear aspects as the domestication of reindeer, for example, but was caught also in patterns of time that spooled out through the land in cycles. What the Chukchi observed about time in the Arctic is resonant in some ways with scientific work on Northern climates and species. Since the last ice age, the Arctic has generally been a cyclical place, one where the climate each century to 50 years brings in a spate of warm seasons. And these warm years were deeply perilous for reindeer. Cold air in the north reduces precipitation. So in warmer winters, there is deep snow that founders reindeer herds. Sometimes rain falls on these drifts and then freezes again, creating, creating a layer of ice that starves reindeer who are unable to paw through uh, the kind of lid that it creates over the ground to the lichens and grass beneath that feed reindeer. Boggy summers infect reindeer's hooves, hinder migration, 
and left them vulnerable to outbreaks of anthrax. For Chukchi, the Arctic climate worked through reindeer to influence life and politics. A family with 5,000 reindeer could, in the course of a decade, find themselves with only hundreds, enough for food, but not for armies. There were no hereditary leaders as a result or fixed hierarchies. Such things were laughable. To walk out on an Arctic morning was always an appeal to a will-filled universe. For, as one Chukchi man told it to an ethnographer not long after Carl Lux was born, nothing created by man has any power. Carl, either Carl Lux or Carl Marx, would not have agreed. Freedom, Frederick Engels wrote, consists in the control over ourselves and over external nature. Human liberation, therefore, came from bending every resource to human need and only humans could be free. This was the fundamental plot for Marx and Engels, this capacity for progress that drew societies from hunting and gathering to agriculture, to industrial capitalism and onward to revolution beyond which there would be no suffering or decay. The idea of time that Karl Lux brought with him to Chukotka was aggressively linear. On that tundra, Karl's task was to identify external nature to control. Chukotka was too cold for traditional agriculture and too distant and rugged for much industry. But there were reindeer with useful meat and foxes with valuable pelts. And there were people that in the Bolshevik view of men like Karl needed saving from the boot hill of natural caprice. So young missionaries of the new culture and the new Soviet state, as one follower of Marx put it, came north to teach the Chukchi about Lenin, like this young teacher who's right behind or right in front of Lenin in this photograph. Or uh, to instruct Chukchi and Yupik people to carve, as in the bottom image here, Lenin um, pictured as hanging out on a stuffed seal skin as he was wont to do, sharing news of the revolution with local peoples in Chukotka. Other new Bolsheviks designed methods of reindeer corralling and pasturing and systems for fox pens and barns. The goal was to eradicate flux in reindeer and fox populations. Out on the tundra, reindeer were seen as in decline in the early years of the Soviet project. And fox numbers, as anyone who had spent any time in the North knew, rose and fell every few years, dependent on cycles of lemmings. Socialist farms, the aspiration went, would replace such inconsistency with predictable growth. Caged foxes also required no long days setting traps out into thickets that foxes prowl. The Chukchi instead could live in town in apartments with electricity and running water while their children, as Carl wrote, could attend a first class school not in the native dialect for a real Soviet education. Carl did not ask the Chukchi if they wanted this new world. No one did, nor did anyone ask the foxes about the pens or the reindeer about the corrals. To do so was not thinkable. Another appeal of the apocalypse is that in proclaiming it is not an act of supplication, but of certainty. In Chukotka, such certainty can seem like a kind of madness. But Carl Lux did not live to see most of it. In 1932, he took an accidental bullet while surveying foxes and reindeer and other life on the Chown River in Chukotka's Northwest. As he bled to death, so the Soviet reports go, he begged his fellow revolutionaries to continue their work, quote, in the most remote places inhabited by natives, no matter the victims, in spite of any cost. In that summer of 2018, as we traveled north toward Amguema, Alex told me how many of the victims who came after Carl were Chukchi. We did not want to live in the way the Soviet said was correct, Alex explains. All around us as we drove were signs of Carl's world, 
the way of life that these structures built into the land, settled, electrified, and educated in Russian, did not signal the promised land to Alex's ancestors as it did for Carl. The Chukchi did not want to give their reindeer to Soviet farms and take day-long shifts in fox barns, or to give over their visions of creation, the raven that made their land long ago, or the boy born from a reindeer's ear for the stories that Bolsheviks told. As we bounced north toward the Ombam River, I thought about the Bolshevik teacher whose memoir I had read some years before. When the teacher pointed to a portrait of Lenin and explained how he that we see hanging on the wall taught that all people will live well only when they themselves make their own lives by learning to read and farm. The Chukchi elder that he was addressing responded, what you say is nonsense. Doesn't Lenin know that we make our own lives for ourselves? After all, the Chukchi, who had begun domesticating reindeer hundreds of years before the Soviets arrived, knew the power of their animals. They knew that reindeer had allowed them political autonomy and could let individuals amass wealth. So when the Bolsheviks went out to try to convince the Chukchi to give their herds over to the state, the Chukchi, quote, received me warmly and willingly talked about general abstract themes and topics that did not directly conserve their livestock, one young Bolshevik reported. But when issues began to touch on the deer and reindeer herding, the Chukchi became wary and stopped talking. In the two decades after Carl died, this difference in what a reindeer should be or who should own it meant violence simmered over the tundra. When asked or required to collectivize their herds, the Chukchi killed their reindeer or killed themselves rather than be part of the new promised land. Sometimes there were open small wars, histories of violence that ran across the land. I thought about this violence, so invisible now in much of Chukotka, but leaving histories right under the surface of any conversation. Around and after this violence, Soviet scientists mapped the hills and rivers in an effort to radically simplify the landscape. Scientists studied tundra plants for methods of rational use by reindeer herders. They learned how to vaccinate the herds, dust them with DDT, and breed individual reindeer for size and temperament. The archives are dense with studies on the use of reindeer milk, sinew, and hides. And as the 20th century wore on, reindeer herding was mechanized, given over not to reindeer pulling sleds, but to fossil fuel tracks and tractors where possible. Wolves were hunted from helicopters and poisoned by the hundreds. The purpose of these interventions was the creation of more reindeer, since more reindeer was a sign of the arrival of Carl Lux's dream, and a linear history and increased productivity on the tundra. And on that tundra, by the 1970s, Chukchi were still in regular relation with reindeer, but the husbandry they undertook now required formal education, and education was found in town. Herding brigades lived in the apartment blocks of the Soviet villages and took week or month long shifts on the tundra, flown in by helicopter and then would sleep in huts dragged behind the herds by tractors and reported to the central farm managers by radio. In town, women looked after foxes in long low barns. Reindeer work had become to any extent possible with a migratory species like factory work. And like Soviet factory work anywhere, there were problems. Tractors would take year to arrive or spare parts were hard to find. People, according to the Soviet records, drank too much and read too little. But the correct socialist form of reindeer husbandry was in place, a way of organizing human and reindeer life for the good of the Soviet Union and for the creation of first rank workers of the tundra, people of a new type who unflinchingly and every year achieve high indices in the field of reindeer breeding, as one manual put it. The Soviet dreams for the reindeer 
could go to such heights that one scientist even wrote that the revolution had brought such new forms of organizing the reindeer herd that the growth on the tundra could be infinite. It was the ultimate linear dream of progress unending, an escape from the limits of moss and lichen and the necessity of relating to other life. It is an irony at the heart of the Marxist project or at least its Soviet variant. In the attempt to free human beings from exploitation, all other life became mere resource. Something else about the apocalypse, its battles only damn or save human beings. In this story, our species has no kin but ourselves. On that day in 2018, we reached the Ombam River by about noon. A quarter mile or so from its banks is the village of Amguema. It's a Soviet town, concrete buildings connected by elevated gas pipes shedding insulation. Entropy has taken over on the outskirts, pulling down houses, filling the space between with fireweed. But in the center, there are curtains and open windows and bright paint on the concrete. We stopped to speak with a group of men in rubber boots, spattered in mud. One of them introduced himself as the mayor. They were digging a drainage ditch, he explained, because the tundra under the town was going soft and seeping water. Alex asked if the reindeer brigades were close. The mayor pointed us to the west, toward the river. If they had returned, he said, their yaranga, their reindeer hide tents would be there. He advised that we walk. Since the fall, he said, the roads have decayed. In Chukotka, when people speak of the fall, what they mean is the Soviet Union ceasing to exist. By that point, in the early 1990s, socialist efforts to control this land had changed many things. It had built the road that we drove north on and the apartment buildings. It brought children into schools, herded reindeer with helicopters and snow machines. In many ways, Chukotka was a Soviet version of the world that we now find normal, where the lights come on with a switch and goods can come from anywhere on a ship or an airplane. But the Soviet Union never did exactly mold time into a linear form. Even before the USSR sundered, reindeer herds defied Soviet prophecy and began to decline due to a series of warm years. Foxes kept dying from rabies and distemper. Carl's most apocalyptic promise, the freedom from any natural constraint proved impossible. And then what had changed under the Soviets disappeared. In my profession, the question of the Soviet collapse is often one of why. Was it the economy, the politics? Was it an ideology that was incompatible with reality? But in Chukotka, the stories of the 1990s bend toward the how. How did we survive a civilization in its ending? All that the Soviets brought with them, the gas heat and the bakeries, the machinery and the medicines was no more. Alex was a child when the electricity stuttered off. There was no gasoline to move supplies, but there were very few supplies to move anyway. For a decade, the region experienced kind of a crash decarbonization the withdrawal of nearly all fossil fuel power. It is not a particularly good model of how to decarbonize. The quick shut off of fuel left older people without medicine or warmth. Mothers worried that the lack of food meant little milk for their infants. Everything was cold. In accounts from the 1990s, people speak of the horizon of time closing. What would summer bring to keep families and whole towns alive during the winter? What would the winter do? The fox barns emptied and untended reindeer went feral or were lost to wolves. Yet each day also came with its small specific tasks of survival. Chukchi families set up their yaronga inside apartments and burned seal oil lamps for warmth and light. Through summer and fall, people picked berries and greens and packed them in seal oil fat for winter. It was good to know hunters who lived along the coast in the villages where elders still remembered how to kill whales without specialized equipment 
it was also good to know how to tend reindeer without helicopters, how to sew reindeer hide boots, or harness a reindeer when the snow machines ran out of fuel. Much of what kept people alive were small things, easily overlooked or dismissed by some historians as mere chores, the women's work of caring. But regardless of gender, solidarity, that old socialist refrain, ceased to be a slogan and became a necessity. At the end of the world, there were no damned or saved souls, only people and other kin to share in the work of making life possible. No one knew what would happen, Alex told me. We couldn't just hope it would end. The trick to surviving was in knowing something about the land and the animals and in keeping on without certainty. When we finally arrived along the Omvam River, the reindeer were still at pasture. None were to be seen as we picked our way over the uneven ground with our parcels of bread and biscuits. On the bank, among low willows, were two yoronga, round and white like landed clouds, and guarded by waist-high dogs like small bears. Alex called out hellos, and from within one of the tents, a voice asked if we wanted tea. Stooping into the Yaranga, I was blinded for a moment by smoke coming off the small fire, its coals sheltering a blackened pot. Near it sat an older man and a woman, Grigori and Anna, they said in introduction. We gave our names and sat cross-legged on reindeer skins, passing over our gifts in exchange for tea. The conversation then looped between Russian and Chukchi, so I did not understand all of it. There were relatives to discuss, news from wider Russia to Parsahan about what Putin was doing in Moscow. I caught that Grigori and Anna were born just after the Chukchi and the Soviets ceased killing each other and were nearly grandparents at the time of the collapse. Their sons work in Amguema part of the year, but were out now with the reindeer. They sell some of the meat in Chukotka's larger towns, sell the antlers south to China, and keep the rest along with the skins for their relatives. The tundra where the reindeer graze has grown strange. There are new insects, Grigori said, beetles the Chukchi have no words for and which eat some of the same plants as the reindeer. Anna was worried about chemicals and cancer from what the Soviets left behind in their military installations but also from the garbage, she said, washed up on the Bering Sea coast after every storm. What does it leach into the fish we all eat from the river? She asked. And then there was the weather. Deep snow, rains that came late into fall for the past few years. We all looked down at our tea. No one knows what's going to happen, Lori said. It's probably a good idea to buy more rubber boots. That afternoon along the Omvam River, I was almost the same age as Carl Lux was when he wrote, to fix this destruction is our task. And we have other things in common. I also came of age, or I am of age, in a world that is too precarious and unjust to continue with impunity. People with power spend lavishly and hire more police. In the United States, our national politics leads less to the poor selling their children to the wealthy than the wealthy stealing children's futures, carbon atom by carbon atom. All around us are whispers of the end. We live in late capitalism, people say, implying imminent sundown. We live in the sixth extinction, people say, calling up the void with a phrase. We live in a climate emergency, a crisis, a thing terribly more than change. The grimmest of these prophecies tells an old story, the ultimate battle in which an unlivable climate will drive out the darkness that we have become, as if the end to human failing is our extinction. The core of this kind of apocalyptic thinking is nihilism. This world is too despoiled to continue. The seduction of such stories is in how certain they make the teller feel. An apocalyptic narrative is like looking at a horizon with no clouds or hills. The way forward is terribly assured. To walk it 
there is no need to mind the lives of others rendered invisible by the power of imagining that they are already gone. Apocalyptic prophecy is also an escape from contemplating and from seeing in the here and now how life goes on even through catastrophe. The Chukotkin Riverbank in Amguema has borne two world endings in the past century, the end of a world without socialists and the end of the world with them. The story that these endings have etched into this earth bears no relation to Zoroaster's final battle or the pure cleansing fire of Karl's revolution. What the land here speaks instead is a tale in which rupture is never complete. For no revolution can excise the quotidian, the need to rise and sleep, to nourish and shelter, to care for new birth and imminent deaths. This is the insurmountable stuff of being. In the company of Chukotka's dead and living, I have come to think that the most terrifying thing about our future is not just what will change or cease or grow uncanny, but all that must continue on regardless. And all of this was visible in the drive to Anguema. Almost a hundred kilometers, the road is marked by sequential clots of debris, by rusted things, broken things, shelters that have fallen open to the sky. One way of seeing this part of Chukotka is as unrelentingly scarred, a place befouled by Soviet remnants, an earth that is beyond saving. Another is to see it as a site of ongoing restitution. The mare down in the mud, making another year livable in his town, the reindeer rib that fed us in the Yaranga, or the fox that we saw raising a new generation of kits inside a lidless rusted oil barrel. One thing that Chukotka makes clear is how we all live in the company of the dead and that we are all also future deaths ourselves, which brings a question, what presence will we be for the lives that come after us? To fix destruction is our task, but what if that mandate summoned not delusions of escape and human grandeur, but of repair? It is not an easy task. It will take, I think, all of what I find inspiring in Karl Lux's story, how he worked hard and collectively, how he believed that justice was possible and that equity was critical. Our uneasy world needs his courage and his bodily sacrifice. And both Lux and the Chukchi have left me suspicious of their almost endless requests, as ubiquitous as talk of apocalypse, to be given hope that most bourgeois feeling of an apocalypse inverted by a spectral, magically better future. And also a privileged claim to desiring a particular emotional state in order to act in times of turmoil. Lux did not write about being given hope from prison, nor do Chukchi speak of easy hope in the 1990s. Instead, the histories that both tell are of injustice becoming justice, of worry, and of hope that they made through action. But Chukotka's history carries other lessons. It asks that we, particularly those of us so privileged as to be imagining the end of the world for a first time, trade the temptation of apocalyptic escapism for world historical humility. It asks for perseverance without certainty, for prophecies that hold space for more than people. Perhaps most of all, Chukotka is a lesson in how restoring what has broken is a reminder to be careful with what is here now. It is an entreaty to make things last, to create better ruins, and to care for what will outlast our small and tender lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bathsheba DeMuth, for that fascinating and eloquent uh, lecture. Um, please, everyone, if you would like to ask questions, uh, just type them into the chat box, and I will happily share them with Bathsheba. I'll, I will uh, start with the question. Um, you are, as you've made quite clear, an environmental historian, uh, but you spoke, especially at the end of your talk, 
uh, about the lessons that history has for the present and for the future. Would you tell us a little bit more about your sense of the importance uh, that, that history has for us in the now and in the future? Thank you, that's a great question, Paul, and one that's near to dear. Um, although I'm sure if you ask you know, 10 historians, you'll get 12 different answers. <laughs> so that, that is my caveat. Um, I think there are a couple of things that make the study of history particularly compelling and important to me at this juncture. Um, one of which is that it takes this moment that we are in where the kind of prevailing economic form and the sense that that kind of economy is driving us into a state of ecological crisis um, and makes it clear that that economy is not the only way of being. Um, that it emerges out of a very particular politics and history. Um, it's something that people have been interested in, in troubling and pushing against at its exploitative edges for a very long time. And it's also not the only way that people have valued and worked with the world that they live in. Um, so I think one of the things I find very valuable about teaching environmental history uh, to undergrads is the way that it, it kind of is a vocabulary of, of possible pasts and therefore possible futures. Um, I think it also is a way of understanding some of the ideas that we take for, for granted. Um, and one of the most powerful things I've found by, by looking into the past is that it, it can sort of denaturalize and shake up some of our assumptions about the stories we tell about how we got to here. Um, and that again can open up um, kind of ways of thinking about what we might want in the future um, and what past societies um, might have been able to do. Um, not in a way that gives you a simple one-to-one -one model, but I think opens up some possibilities rather than imagining that we're on one set trajectory and, and can't do much about it. So you've given us a sense of uh, the, the research and work that you've done on the Chukchi Peninsula in the past. Uh, our next questioner is asking, are you continuing to do research on that peninsula or what, what, what is the research that you're currently doing? That's a great question in part because due to COVID, I'm, I'm not doing much research anywhere that's not in my living room, like most of us. Um, the, the project that I am working on when I, when I can travel again um, is a history of the Yukon River watershed. Um, so it's all in what we now call North America, um, and, but partly is still a Russian story because um, the Russian and British empires meet along the Yukon River in the 19th century. And what interests me in that part of the world um, are some issues that, that started to come up as I was writing this first book. Um, and I wanted to sit with for a bit longer um, about the ways in which uh, kind of legal ideas or ideas that, that come out of traditions of providing um, justice and kind of structures of law um, are applied to to beings that aren't human or spaces that are not human to you know forests and, and watersheds but also to dogs and beavers and caribou and other kinds of animals um, and how these these legal ideas really influence what we do with the environments that we live in um, and in turn if those environments themselves actually change how people think about the um, how law should operate and the Yukon is an interesting place to think about these things because it has such a kind of diverse set of indigenous legal traditions, um, both past and present. And the Russian and British empires kind of meet there with their own legal ideas. Um, and then the U United States and Canada now kind of share a border along the Yukon. Um, and although I think sometimes are lumped together, actually have fairly distinct ways of thinking about um, sovereignty and land ownership and um, different kinds of rights. You explained the appeal of apocalyptic narratives in that they give a kind of certainty. Um, given that appeal, what advice you have or what suggestions you have about how to make less apocalyptic narratives, uh, narratives of repair or restoration have a kind of appeal that can overcome the lure of false certainty? I wish I had an easy answer to that. Um, I think one way to think about it is that um, I have observed that some of the most apocalyptic narratives that I see, particularly about climate change in the media, 
um, are written by people who are coming to the idea of extreme climate change for the first time. Um, and that the kind of available way of, of thinking of social and ecological upheaval is that everything has to come to an end. Um, I joke with my undergrads that at some point in every class, we end up talking about Mad Max because it's such sort of an available model, um, if not a particularly realistic model. And that one thing that looking at societies like the Chukchi who have kind of experienced these sequences of world ending moments, um, not necessarily on a global scale, the way that the climate crisis provides, but certainly crises that implicate both social systems and ecological spaces um, is that they're, the world doesn't end, right? Um, and the question is, how do you figure out ways of continuing? And in that continuance, is there actually some space for thinking of a more just world? Um, is, is there ways of thinking of returning to sets of values that perhaps um, we wish were more emphasized? Um, and, and generally speaking, these are stories in which um, survival requires people working together. It's kind of the opposite of a Mad Max scenario. Um, and it's one in which people um, discover ways of, of truly kind of collective uh, work in solidarity. Um, so I think in some ways the factual record is a, is a place to contest with the kind of fictional specters that we set up for ourselves. Um, and that I think that hopefully that will give us some sense that we are not doomed um, to, to be the, the worst version of humanity in a future that's going to be harder. The next question is from a colleague of mine in the, uh, who teaches Russian history. And she is also a Humanities Center fellow this year, uh, Julie Hessler, and it's, it's a lengthy question. So uh, Julie's really struck by your image of the Soviet collapse as the time when electricity turned off and fossil fuels disappeared. You eloquently described the dislocations that occurred and the ways that Chukchi had to turn to elders who hadn't forgotten older traditions. Julie's wondering about the economic and cultural trajectory of Chukchi communities in the past 20 years. Have they become knitted into Russia again? And if so, how? How do they obtain beyond their own subsistence? And how do they pay for things like tea? And how has the 1990s experience of total isolation shaped Chukchi identity and consciousness? That's an excellent question. And hi, Julie, from, <laughs> from the virtual realms. Um, so since the 1990s, um, Chukotka went through this couple of years of being really cut off. Um, and in, in Russian, people actually refer to um, kind of non Chukchi Peninsula parts of Russia as the mainland, as if it's not connected by the continent. Um, so just to give a sense of like how remote and how distant people feel. Um, when I first got there, I was like, why do you keep talking about going to the mainland? We're on, you know, the same continent, but it, it really kind of gets at the sense that it is a place apart. And it was very apart in the 90s for some years. Um, coming out of that, Chukotka has this kind of fascinating position in Russia in that it is very far away, um, but garnered some early attention from some very uh, prominent oligarchs who actually invested quite a bit of money at the end of the 1990s. Um, Abramovich, uh, who owns one of the big uh, football clubs in the UK and several giant yachts, um, also had became sort of the patron of Chukotka and did some rebuilding and kind of moved some resources there in ways that, you know, as people will explain to you, you know, had a lot to do with laundering money, but actually did pull some resources back into the peninsula. Um, and it now, in many ways, because of the infrastructure built by the Soviets, it, has a more kind of robust set of connections between communities than say analogous communities on the American side of the strait that didn't have that kind of building. And as a result has um, kind of in the ways of many Northern communities, um, a seasonal economy around um, mining and some other uh, kinds of activities. Um, there is a market for reindeer meat and some reindeer products um, in Chukotka and also in China that give people access to the, now it is the market economy. Um, there's a lot of sort of government bureaucratic jobs. So, you know, people who are paid because they're teachers or medical workers um, or work in the local governments in some way. Um, and so that is sort of kind of pulling cash into the economy. Um, 
So it's, it's kind of a mix between, you know, people still participating in subsistence activities and people having access to income in other forms. Um, and it's a place that right now is really at this, um, I feel like it's at this kind of teeter-totter moment because um, as the, the summer sea ice extent decreases really radically, um, the, the ability to run tanker ships uh, from Asia north of Russia to Europe uh, by way of the Arctic Ocean is becoming um, a, a likely possibility. Um, a couple of ships have gone through in the last uh, two summers and I think um, you know, each year the sea ice extent decreases and so it becomes more safe to do that. And that means that there will be shipping um, and kind of port traffic on the kind of coastal parts of Chukotka, which will offer other kinds of employment um, and probably some pretty severe coastal or social disruption because um, port cities, you know, they're, they can be difficult places socially. Um, so there's kind of a feeling in Chukotka right now of, of bracing for what this future will bring. Um, if there will be increased fossil fuel exploitation off the coast, as Russia has started talking about, um, most of those are, are um, offshore marine reserves. And so they're really expensive. They're not on the docket right now, but people can kind of see them coming. Um, and so that, that's kind of on the horizon for the peninsula. So you mentioned in your talk that the Soviets uh, did not see uh, thought that they had no kin but themselves, whereas the Chukchi had a worldview that in, it entailed uh, coexistence with a range of different beings and different kin. Um, can you say a little bit about the degree to which Chukchi um, faith or uh, um, belief systems have returned, uh, or are they have they been supplanted or significantly transformed by the interventions from Russia and the Soviet Union? I think in some pretty core ways, they never and they never went away. Um, you know, as is true with many colonized cultures that, you know, certain expression, certain social expressions go underground or are not done as publicly or, you know, fade out of practice. But um, the there is an underlying kind of ethical commitment to the ways that people relate to each other um, and to animals, um, the ways that ceremonies are handed down within families, um, that the Soviet Union, you know, despite its truly its best efforts did not eradicate. Um, and I think there's freer space to express some of those now, um, because they're not considered openly hostile to the state. Um, so, you know, I, in many ways, it, it's a story like many stories of indigenous peoples colonized by outsiders, um, who kind of find ways of keeping those those traditions alive. Um, and then in the, this moment in the 90s of kind of difficult and radical decarbonization was also, people remember it both kind of ethnic Russians who lived in Chukotka and uh, Chukchi people as a time of really kind of interesting social reversal that it, under the late Soviet state, the most prestigious jobs were usually filled by ethnic Russians and people from the outside and the, you know, the, the doctors and the, you know, government manager sort of positions. Um, and those folks who didn't leave as soon as the collapse became clear, actually ended up very dependent on Chukchi, who had the ability to, you know, take care of the reindeer, to bring in seal. And so there was this moment in the 90s where um, the kind of hierarchies of the Soviet Union inverted themselves um, and, and people do not have nostalgia for the 1990s because they were extremely hard, but there is some discussion of the ways in which that moment of reversal has un, kind of switched back again, um, that the, the, you know, the power center in Russia is in Moscow um, and that that has returned in a way that is not entirely positive. Is there a large percentage of ethnic Russians in, in the region still? Um, it's gone down. It was the majority, but in the 1990s, um, in large part because there were large military installations. So there were large numbers of troops and associated personnel and they basically all left. Um, I can't remember. And now I think it is, um, majority indigenous again. Um, and most of the non-ethnic Russians or the ethnic Russians live in Anadir, which is the capital, um, 
or Pivec, which is a big mining center up in the north. Um, and these smaller villages are almost all indigenous. So the next question is from another colleague in history here, Jeff Osler, who is a, a, a historian of uh, America and Native America. Jeff writes, I very much appreciate how you've given us a compelling account of a particular case of indigenous survival and a sense of a political consciousness that might come from that. Is there in your way of thinking any place for leftist revolutionary thinking, especially if tempered by indigenous ethics, as in some of the indigenous activism around pipelines and in native political theorists like Nick Estes or Glenn Coulthard? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and, and yes, um, I think that um, one of the most compelling thing to me about the work that people like Nick Estes are doing is thinking about the parts of socialism that I also find really compelling, um, that emphasis on a, a generally, you know, a genuinely liberatory politics and one that really is committed to the idea of equity. It, it didn't work in the Soviet case. It went awry for a variety of, of reasons, um, but you really can't read those early Bolsheviks without thinking that these were people that were really deeply committed to the idea that societies have to be just um, and that capitalism cannot be, that it just does not have it in its operating structure. Um, but I think that what Estes and other kind of indigenous spins on socialism are doing is trying to think about it without the connection to, first of all, kind of Promethean um, kind of industry, which is so at the core of the, the Soviet project to kind of catch up with capitalism and surpass it on its own terms. Um, so thinking about economies that would actually look different and look different because they relate to ecologies in different ways, um, which might not be Estes terms, but I think that to me that is what is really compelling about those visions is that they they acknowledge not just that human beings have to be able to socialize with each other, but that human sociality exists in this much broader and more capacious vision than, than, than Marx had in mind, right? Marx was really thinking about people and only people. Um, so I, I do, I think it's some of the most you know, interesting and, and obviously um, like practically um, forceful kind of political organizing around the environment that's happening in the last decade. It's clear from the talk that you've given that you are, among other things, a prose stylist. It's not always the case that historians are prose stylists, or not always the case that historians see a kind of um, literary eloquence as part of their responsibility. Could you say a little bit about your sense of uh, how you think about the writing of history and the importance of writing history with style? First of all, thank you. Um, and secondly, I think um, part of the reason that I became a historian um, when I was thinking about grad school was because I saw it from, from the outside before I had been trained in it as a discipline as being um, one of the places in the academy where the kind of form of the research is narrative. Like that's, you know, our, our methods are all expressed through you know, either short or long narratives um, that emerge out of historical sources, but it's fundamentally an act of storytelling um, in a way that other social sciences um, are perhaps less so. Um, and that within that kind of narrative impulse within history, it's also a really heterodox field that you can write history in many different ways and be accepted as a historian. There's not kind of one, you know, rhetorical mode that um, you can you can speak to. It really has to do with you know, sources and argumentation, but that can come out in a variety of ways. And what I found compelling about that is that it struck me as a place where um, some of the ideas and the, um, the, the really compelling and important work that is produced within the academy can find a way outside of it um, through that kind of narrative mode. And that, you know, people are interested in reading history. There's a real appetite for it. Um, and there's an appetite for new kinds of history, I think, um, and the, the trick with kind of meeting that audience where they are is, is writing the stories in ways that are compelling um, and, you know, telling people into, into the past in ways that they might not have thought about before. Um, and I 
for one thing, just take pleasure in doing that. Um, it's, it's like incredibly, you know, terrible hair pulling work at some level, but it also is incredibly fulfilling when you're, you are actually able to kind of show people a vision of the past they might not have thought about before. Um, and I also think it's just in, important because these stories really do shape the ways in which our political cultures and, and social lives are formulated. Um, and that if we're in a discipline that lets us do this, um, why not? Um, and I realize that for some people, that's not the motivating, you know, thing. And that, you know, we need many kinds of historians and I'm not, I'm not gonna be prescriptive about it. Um, but for me, that's one of the real opportunities of the discipline is that we can, we can speak to audiences, broad audiences. Um, and for me, it was important to read a book or to write a book that could be read, you know, by people who do not have, you know, years and years of historical training um, in part because many of the folks around the Bering Strait um, you know, they have years and years of historical training, but not in the kind of ways in which the academy does it. Um, and I wanted to be accessible to those communities. So the next question is again from Julie Hessler, and it's a it's a literary question. Um, it's connected to the question about religious beliefs. Uh, Julie's wondering, the Soviets must have cultivated a Chukchi literary tradition. It's to the side of your themes but Julie's wondering if you have explored the literary representation of Chukchi belief and experiences by Chukchi authors and how those writings have changed since the Soviet collapse. That's also a wonderful question. Thank you, Julie. Um, so one of the, um, the Soviet Union for, for people who don't spend a lot of time in the Soviet realms had a, um, a very robust policy in the kind of early years of encouraging speakers of non-Russian languages to write literature in their languages. So, you know, I have pages and pages of scanned newspapers from Chukotka in the 20s and 30s um, that, you know, have a section that's in Russian and a section that's in Yupik and a section that's in Chukchi, which are kind of the two big indigenous language groups. Um, that kind of fades out after the Second World War, but there is this real kind of drive to um, give people access to literary culture in their whatever language, if it's Kazakh, if it's uh, Chukchi, um, it happens all over the Soviet Union. And um, out of that, probably the most prominent author um, is a man named Yuri Vitheu, um, who died in the early 2000s. Um, and he, he was born in the 1930s. Um, and his early work is, you know, it's sort of very classic Soviet written in the 1930s, 40s. I mean, it, um, he was born in the 30s, so he doesn't really start writing until the 40s and 50s. Um, but, you know, kind of classic stories about the Soviet Union vanquishing the, the American capitalists who were trading on the Chukchi Peninsula in the 19th century, um, kind of Soviet morality tales. Um, and mostly are stories about Chukchi people kind of emerging from this benighted past into the Soviet present. Um, and he was always kind of a, a good prose stylist, but the the plot is one that if you've ever read a Soviet novel, you kind of know the, the beats of. Um, and he has a really interesting life trajectory because he becomes increasingly disillusioned with that plot by the by the 80s. Um, he kind of starts saying behind closed doors that, you know, he just writes these novels because they're a paycheck. Um, he doesn't really kind of believe in the project anymore. Um, and then he starts writing novels that, um, that don't contain any Soviet elements at all um, and are, are kind of articulations in a modern prose form of classic Chukchi stories um, and stories in which, you know, whales are, are people and people become whales and, you know, they're, they really have nothing to do with the Soviet cosmology anymore at all. Um, and these are the novels that have been mostly translated into English and actually kind of got him quite a bit of acclaim um, in international audiences by the, the 1990s and the 2000s. And even a little bit before that, um, he, he ended up being pretty close friends with Farley Moet, um, who if you've read kind of Canadian environmental literature, um, they, they kind of got to know each other. Um, and I think, you know, there's only so much you can do with one person's biography, but I think his life trajectory is a really interesting one in terms of um, you know, there's not indication in his own kind of writing about his past that his early interest in the Soviet project was not genuine, um, that, you know, he actually, he was kind of interested and intrigued and drawn in by this idea, 
Um, he was educated in Leningrad. He had, you know, kind of this classic education in literature, uh, was interested in using, you know, Russian literary ideas in combination with Soviet storytelling. Um, but then by the 1980s is not seeing the kind of promise of the Soviet Union as bearing out. Um, and I think that that's one. Um, and, and I think, you know, underneath that, although one has to extrapolate a little bit is, you know, some disillusionment with the ways in which the violence of colonization in the, the 30s to the 50s is just written out of the official record. Um, and that, that that's something that starts to emerge in his work also. So we've come to the end of our questions and the end of our time. I want to uh, offer my thanks again to Prof Professor Bathsheba DeMuth for this fascinating lecture and conversation and to our viewers for joining us today and for the questions that you've shared with us. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. You're very welcome. For more information on other upcoming virtual events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center and to contribute to supporting events and research programs like, like today's lecture, visit ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.